Well, hi, friends, and uh, welcome uh, to our continuing um, Science of Triangles uh, programs, where we go a little deeper into the astrological theory behind it all, um, and the rheological theory. And then this morning, of course, we did have the, um, yeah. I'll just uh, put that out there. Right. Thank you. Um, we did have our normal triangles uh, meditation. Now, it just so happens, maybe you got the letter and, and uh, the communications group was uh, very responsive and got this out right away. I just realized that today, uh, September 9th, is the 35th anniversary of the incorporation of the Seven Ray uh, Institute. And I already received a uh, little note from uh, Dorothy Maver, and uh, there was Marianne Casolino, and, and Rick, of course, has passed on, Rick Good. But in any case, uh, we'll be switching over uh, to uh, a kind of a broadcast. I just want to do a little meditation. I wish I had done it in such a way that uh, people could talk, but at least there will be a uh, a panel uh, for or a side side uh, bar for comments if you want to write something, and I'll take that up uh, in in a couple of hours, and we'll make sure we stop so that I can run over to the other computer in the temple and uh, get the broadcast going. Already, it is, in a way, going. So uh, there, I have one lonely slide that says says that we're, we're celebrating the 35th uh, anniversary of the incorporation. We uh, basically um, started the whole thing on uh, 5 o'clock in the morning, 5.02 or something like that, on June 1st, 1985. And by the time we received a notification of incorporation, it was September uh, 9th, which just happened to be the, the birthday of uh, Kurt Abraham, who has done so much for the advancement of the seven uh, rays in through his books. And uh, well, he's done a great job with all of that. So it was just uh, kind of coincidental. But anyway, we'll get to it. It'll be a simple meditation. And uh, if you want to join us uh, on the, um, the usual YouTube link, um, that's where we'll be. That's where we will be holding it. Now, wow, we have um, we have the fifth ray at this point that we're going to be discussing. We've been just taking it one ray at a time, basically. And these are the ray triangles, um, as you know. Um, and these triangles are foundational to everything we are doing. So they are sources of uh, transmission, uh, sources of transmission for uh, uh, the, the seven rays and each uh, triangle, of course, has three signs and a particular ray coming through it. So as soon as I welcome you, I will get into it and we'll discuss this very important fifth ray, which involves the um, the energy of initiation particularly. I want to just say hi, though, uh, to Anne uh, Nguyen and Anne Peterson and Annette and Ario, uh, Barbara and Brennan, uh, Catherine, uh, Helen, and uh, Isabella, uh, uh, Jan and Joe and Joan and Johi and Catherine and Carrie, uh, Lona, Margo, Mariana, Mariut, uh, Martha and Miro, and Yenka and Risto, Tia, uh, and Tuya is over here, and maybe 
someone can put her on the other side there. Uh, Michael, if you'd be so kind, and Vicky. Also, Walter and Winnie and Ivana and Zenaidi and Anne Veronica. Welcome to you. And uh, over here on the staff side, uh, BL and Joe and Michael Stacy and Tuya is uh, there too, uh, keeping everything in order. I mean, it's a bit spontaneous to realize, oh my goodness, this is the 35th uh, <laughs> anniversary of an event which has been really uh, important in spreading the teaching. But uh, that's the way things have been occurring to me lately. Uh, I've been so involved with many things. Now, um, so let's take a look at Leo, Sagittarius, and Aquarius. These are three signs and, and really three constellations that he calls like galaxies of stars or asterisms, really which are constellations and have a certain appearance, at least from our, our perspective in space. And that appearance seems to have an awful lot to do with what they stand for, for us. So we have the constellation Leo, bright and brilliant. Constellation Sagittarius, also bright and brilliant. And Aquarius, uh, more faint perhaps, but then uh, its time is coming. Now, what is it about Leo that brings in the fifth ray? And uh, I want to say that um, Leo rules many things. It's the whole quest of identity, one's own identity as distinct from the identity of others. Uh, at first, it's that way. I am a distinct identity. See. Leo, the fifth ray is connected with what's called, <clears throat> excuse me, the law of cleavages. And it creates separation between this and that. Now, that is extremely important in the whole process of individualization. And when we go back to the days when animal man, whose intelligence was um, well, th that of a, a, a highly uh, advanced animal, but, but not uh, really uh, uh, recognized as individualized until maybe three million years after the actual individualization took place in, in Sagittarius. Uh, the, the fifth ray was very important in Lemurian days because it helped the um, the newly developing human being through the law of cleavages distinguish himself herself um, from the mass. Cancer was the mass. It was a state of unconsciousness of individual identity. But along comes the appearance of the point or the line or the whatever method of distinction we might use. And so we had the possibility of an extrication of the individual from a state of uh, uh, in, in semi-intelligent animal unconsciousness. And Leo has operated in, in that way up till a certain point. Um, it has made it possible uh, for the human being to grow uh, as an object of his own attention. And thus we have the uh, birth of the lower ego and the sense of self-recognition as a separate unit. Now that was very important at the time of individualization because we needed to, if you're going to create a human being, you need to separate that human being from the mass consciousness. And the fifth ray and Leo are excellent at doing exactly that. So this was one of the major signs 
uh, found at individualization. Now, interestingly enough, um, exactly for that reason, in Lemuria, uh, the fifth ray uh, for the Lemurian root race, the fifth ray operating, of course, on a lower turn of the spiral was uh, very important. And we have kept it up, really, um, as we have advanced in our growth, keeping our eyes upon the personal self, which has been uh, brought to our attention through the powers of Leo and the fifth ray. Now, DK is always telling us, take your eyes off your personal self, but then he is talking to disciples. In the beginning, this stage of uh, distinction uh, was most important. And of course, it takes us through many phases of selfishness, uh, even as a highly developed human being who is opening the fifth petal of the egoic lotus. Uh, he uh, tends to be uh, aware, uh, unusually aware of himself as a unit. And that goes on for quite a while until the results of selfishness are brought home to him. You know that the fifth ray has so much to do with what we might call concretion and with the concrete mind. And DK says, well, this sign Leo, you know, this um, magnificent sign for individualization and for the development of true identity, but can also be found wherever the Black Lodge, uh, the Lodge of Materialism, the Lodge uh, which extinguishes the light, strangely, uh, is active. So it was uh, found uh, in Rome uh, very strongly. It was found in the uh, period of the French kings, uh, with France being ruled by Leo on the personality side. It was found um, in the Second World War uh, through, through Germany and uh, through some of the other Axis powers like Leo, like uh, Italy and uh, the rising sun of, uh, well, uh, fascist Japan at the time. Uh, it emphasized the domination of a people over others and their superiority complex, mainly because they were cut off by their concrete mind from seeing the value of others. And basically he said, look, don't uh, make the concrete mind a sphere unto itself, the 13th sphere, because that will be uh, the greatest disaster that can befall a human being. So, uh, interestingly enough, the Lodge of Materialism operates on the first ray and fifth ray. If you look at the Tetractis, you know, like, uh, you know what a Tetractis is. It, it looks like uh, the pins in a bowling alley. You know, there's a one, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, three, four. The fifth uh, unit is right under the first. They go together, and the Lodge of Materialism uh uses those two rays and the psychopathology to which they are subject um makes them at length uh untouchable you know they are completely uh isolated in their own vortex which is coming under the third ray and uh, the science of relations um uh, generated under love and wisdom does not exist for them. Uh, relations are strictly uh, transactional. They, they utilize other, others for their own purposes, but it's not a true heart relationship, even though Leo does rule the heart. So, um, but then, you know, when it comes to the fifth ray, if things get too concrete and too egotistical and too separative, there is a great fall from the tower, as we are uh, exemplified in the Tarot card. Uh, forget which it is, you know, maybe the 
16th card or 15th or 16th card, somewhere in there, um, they fall and they suffer. And because of the uh, suffering and the smashing of the ego, the lower ego, sort of the Humpty Dumpty effect, you know, the egg is, is, is smashed, they begin to realize that the uh, possibilities of a new way exist for them, and that is the way of repentance and discipleship, aspiration and discipleship. So that by the time we leave this fifth petal, in a sense connected with the fifth ray, just by numer numerological or numerical affinity, we are already an initiate of the first uh, degree. And that um, we have separated ourselves, the number five is very important, separated ourselves in order to join the fifth kingdom again which has a very strong connection with the uh, fifth ray, which is the ray of luminosity. It's the brightest of the ray lords, just the way Venus is the, for us at least, uh, in terms of visual magnitude, it's the brightest of the, uh, of the planets in terms of its effect upon us. And as you know, it is the alter ego. So of the earth. So this number five has everything to do with the path of initiation and the growing intensification of the light. And so we move from that separative attitude of I am, and we, you know, under which we built ourselves up as a uh, quite a strong personality that is capable, at least of reflecting the soul. We, we've gone to I am that, where that, that isolative quality of the fifth ray begins to give way uh, to the light and we are related to others in terms of the light of the soul and we begin to recognize others in the light of the soul which the fifth ray has helped us discover so you know leo is the will to illumine and we begin to live a far more lighted life under the initiatory dispensation of the fifth ray and that's you know kind of the stage at which uh, we find ourselves presently uh you know we're not uh, exactly making a strong application to monadic consciousness we may be interested in it but uh, the main thing is soul infusion by following the science of the soul science of initiation so in a, in a way, the fifth ray here is connected with the uh, science of initiation and the careful following of it. And Master DK has given us all these rules uh, and laws to help us follow that carefully, scrupulously. So when combined with uh, the first ray and the seventh ray and the fifth ray, we have the possibility of treating the form in the right way to advanced soul relations with others. We have to do something correct with the form in order for the love wisdom aspect to really show itself as it should. And then finally, we have the monadic um, application uh, of this. Uh, the one initiator, uh, Sanat Kumara, after the Christ's term of initiation, is um, uh, appearing at an initiation where the fifth ray is dominating. So here's how it goes. First initiation, seventh ray. Second initiation, sixth ray. Third initiation, fifth ray. And that's the time when the monad begins to make its presence felt. I guess, you know, that's a good way of describing it, I think, because we're, we are dealing with the presence and the angel of the presence in a way introduces us uh, to uh, the monadic presence within us uh, on a very uh, high level. And then our mantram changes here to I am that I am or I am that and that I am. 
So it's not just a question of uh, unity and uh, right relations. It's a question of oneness. I am that I am. I am that and that I that am I. Uh, and this is um, uh, leading us to the higher initiation, third, fourth, and finally fifth, where we become the completed human being. And then as we move on into the sixth initiation, a different ray appears. It's the uh, third ray, uh, particularly, and uh, the Chohanic relationship is there. And of the Chohans, DK says, you may remember, they are no longer men as are the masters. So the very apotheosis of humanhood, uh, Da Vinci's man, the five-pointed star, relates to the fifth uh, initiation. And uh, by numerical affinity, even though the fifth initiation is ruled by the first ray, okay, um, it has to have a connection with the brilliant luminosity of the fifth ray, the most luminous of the uh, ray lords, whereas the second ray is the most luminous type of soul. That's, that's how he distinguishes uh, between them. So you can see the importance of the fifth ray all the way from making a difference between man and the mass uh, at the uh, individualization uh, initiation. It is a kind of initiation. It, maybe it was done differently on the moon chain and in the previous solar system. But nevertheless, the fifth ray is involved. And with a, a growing mind uh, bringing us into the possibility uh, of uh, right relations and the realization of being one in soul with others, overcoming separation, and finally uh, into the uh, un fettered enlightenment that we have Leo and the fifth ray of the monad. So, you know, that's kind of some of the reasons why the fifth ray is coming through Leo, the fifth sign, okay? Now, the first ray is there too, the will to rule, but we hope to rule with real intelligence and science. There, there are issues even in society right now uh, having to do with this pandemic. Do we go with wishful, selfish, wishful thinking, or do we uh, allow the testimony of science to guide us? Um, and, uh, you know, the battle, the battle is on because there is the irrational part of my, man which resists the scientific luminous approach. But eventually the unfettered enlightenment of, the, uh, of Shambhala and uh, the access to the monad uh, that the angel of the presence gives a great representative of the fifth creative hierarchy again all these fives keep coming in will lead us into monadic awareness so the five goes to one and through science we enter oneness so th these are ways of you know there's quite a bit to say about this fifth sign and the fifth ray as for Sagittarius, um, it's mainly a sixth ray sign, and it has much to do with the fourth ray of <clears throat> human experience. Let's get out there and actually be in the experience and experience the high and lows of things, the direct contact. But there is the fifth ray too, and it is the urge to discovery through the mind. Now, when you look at uh, uh, these uh, anthropological ventures and you look at National Geographic and you look at all kinds of exploration of uh, places where man has not been yet, even areas of space where he has not been, the fifth ray got us there, along with Sagittarius. This will to see beyond the immediate horizon and using the fifth ray of science to project ourselves beyond the immediate horizon. In other words, we don't just go there to experience, we go there to study. 
uh, the new environments into which Sagittarius brings us. Now, also, Sagittarius uh, shot the first arrow, which led to individualization, even if not to self-recognition. Uh, Three million years later, in a treatise on cosmic fire, that you know there was that thing about uh, the tiny babe, and the tiny babe knew it not. Uh, he had been individualized. The tiny consciousness knew it not. And if I can just maybe go here and refresh our memory here for a treatise, uh, and we'll say babe uh, and tiny. There's only one. Not a word you normally find. The sons of God shot forth like arrows from the bow. The forms received the impulse, and lo, a God was born. The tiny babe uh, knew it knew not the great event, and it took three million years before waking up to that. That so the Sagittarius event. Um, which helped to distinguish or implant, let us say, the fifth creative hierarchy into the brain of man and into the mind of, you know, of animal man. It took place 21 million years ago. He gives the figure. And if we knew exactly at the, uh, that figure is uh, semi-symbolic. Um, but it also, uh, and, and he says we can't really prove it, but I think it was written in the 30s and the 21,688,345 years ago. So it was a certain time in the 1930s, but at the same time, there's symbolism in this. So it took a long time before the human, uh, coord the coordination between brain and mind took place. And the human being was definitely self-conscious. Now, not in the beginning. Human being was not self-conscious. But the human being had been separated somehow through the shooting of that arrow uh, and entered the fourth kingdom of nature. Interestingly enough, Sagittarius also uh, connects with the fourth kingdom. Um, you know, or at least with the fourth ray that rules the fourth kingdom. Now, what we're trying to do is enter the fifth kingdom of nature, which we can do at the first initiation, which definitely, you know, involves our scientific study uh, to a certain extent, at least, of uh, what we must uh, do to uphold the various rules and a little bit of the science of initiation. So uh, this fifth kingdom of nature is interesting because, because basically Sagittarius rules the first two initiations, which are the first two initiations within the fifth kingdom of nature. It has a connection with wisdom, Sagittarius, and we're entering at the fifth kingdom, which we're trying to, you know, enter. We're, we're, we're entering this um, hall of wisdom. The Hall of Wisdom, the the fifth ray, uh, the fifth kingdom, Sagittarius and the Hall of Wisdom all go together. And, you know, in the early days, we say, oh, a God was born, meaning that we, the, the monad had somehow made some kind of contact with its outer instrument. But now we're going to say that the soul is born that inner self which connects with all others and eventually knows uh, through exploration and um, through the study of the wisdom and through the inner adventuring that there is no my soul and thy soul but only uh, the soul so right now we're using sagittarius and the fifth ray to really learn wisely about the fifth kingdom. It's not the way it was in the early days where we just had what's called the um, implantation. The implantation of the spark of mind on the mental plane at the point of the mental unit, 
and also a, a connection with the brain of animal man and the heart center of the angel that sent forth the arrow. Uh, so from, from the time 21 million years ago, we were individualized, but we knew it not. Now, some of us probably were individualized in a different way on the moon chain or even in the previous solar system, but for the bulk of humanity, uh, this was the way of individualization, and uh, Sagittarius was part of that uh, making man distinct from the mass. At least he had the germ of distinction implanted within him. The germ of i we might say, was planted within him and only realized later under the great sign of i which is Leo. So I think that, you know, gives us a little bit of an idea there uh, about um, the relation of Sagittarius to the, uh, the exploratory sign, to the fifth ray of discovery. You know, both are involved with discovery and uh, a new kingdom uh, coming up and then again a new kingdom coming up through the uh, adventuring. The, uh, of Sagittarius, the willingness to go beyond and to study a new environment and to learn, even if concretely, all about a new environment. In this case, the environment of the soul. And this operates with the first two initiations. Now, later, again, it's going to happen. How does it happen? Well, uh, Sagittarius is ruling the ninth petal because it's the ninth sign. So it's going to take us into the realm of the monad uh, just as the third initiation is beginning. That's a whole new study, a whole new type of light. The fifth ray is always associated with light, new light, and so is Sagittarius. Unless, of course, the sixth ray sweeps it away and it becomes rigid and fanatical. I mean, there is that possibility as well. And then let's go to the sixth initiation because this is uh, the, the sign uh, which majorly brings in the sixth ray. What happens there? Uh, the liberated monad, liberated onto the highest plane, the logoic plane, begins a big adventure. Uh, the adventure of the way of higher evolution. So I don't know if I have. Uh, well, I think I, I I think I could get it really quickly. You know, this operates a little different from Zoom, right? You know, so um, so you know, in some ways it's easier, in some ways it's harder. And let's just say uh, here we have. Uh, these ones that Tuya did, and um, based on ones that Keith Bailey did, and uh, we're all uh, looking at this thing. And here's the great adventure, if I can, if it'll just come up, yeah. Um, the great adventure ruled by Sagittarius takes us to other planets for training, other sacred planets. It liberates us, and you know, Sagittarius is a great sign of freedom. It liberates us onto the into the sea of fire, for which there are so many different names in theosophy. But you know, let's just consider it this uh, great uh, patterning uh, force uh, in the world of causes. And then from the sea of fire up here, the liberated monad liberated because it no longer has a causal body, a, a, a monadic body to deal with, takes a big adventure onto the cosmic astral plane, the majority going to Sirius on the cosmic astral plane, and uh, or the uh, the second path, whatever it's, it's called. Uh, I always uh, end up forgetting that. Um, uh, Gosh, you know, it was just in my mind just the other day. It's a simple, simple term. But anyway, it, it deals with uh, improving our astral plane, magnetic work or something like that. And then uh, go, some people go to the uh, 
mental plane, the planetary logoi types and the the ray path types and the people that are going on the path of absolute sonship, they go here. And some even as far as the cosmic buddhic plane, and I have a feeling that the path of absolute sonship leads to the great uh, super cosmic uh, karmic plane, uh, super cosmic atmic plane. Anyway, Sagittarius, every adventure, you know, the, that that starts out from the time you are a chohan and becoming a liberated monad is under sagittarius and you wander far on that path it will probably be the path should be anyway as far as i understand the path on which you descended when you came into denser and denser and more uh, constricted uh, circumstances so Sagittarius and the fifth ray exploring new environments, but in a way, old environments, because you came down that way. And uh, Sagittarius, the fifth ray, and what's called recognition, recognition, recognition. Ah, you recognize that again, because you've been there. Only this time you're even more equipped as a monad to understand. So that's Sagittarius and the fifth ray, at least a few ways of thinking about um, that, that particular ray triangle and the Sagittarian part of it connected with the fifth ray. Now with Aquarius, uh, maybe no question, um, right now Leo is the foremost sign of the fifth ray. It, it still is doing a lot to bring human beings into the state of personality because there are not so many real personalities. And when we say, oh, that person's really got personality, we're often talking about some kind of uh, the it, the magnetism, that kind of thing, but it's not necessarily integration at all. So right now, Leo is the major, more of the fifth ray is coming through Leo than through any other sign, but you can imagine that in the double age of Aquarius, now, first of all, we've got the small age of Aquarius coming up, beginning in the year 2117. Already the overlap is happening. And then we have the large 25,000 or almost 26,000 big age of Aquarius that's called a Platonic year. And we don't know exactly when it begins, but relatively soon. And DK says that our um, our science will not reveal the exact time of the beginning of the great age of Aquarius, but then the fifth ray will rule. And it will rule, already you see it happening uh, in this way. It, it, it's a question of the discovery of subtle energy. Now, usually where scientists are today or up well, what was it? Uh, toward the end of the 19th century, some scientists were saying, well, there just is no more use to study physics because everything that can be known is known. Okay, well, that's a, that's a guarantee that you're about to really be surprised uh, at all the things you don't know. And then in comes from the fifth ray ashram, the, uh, the science of relativity, you know, and, and all of those kind of difficult things to understand about time and space and the bending of uh, space and the shortening and elongation of time, uh, relativity uh, coming in uh, with a very strong fifth ray and a lot of third ray in there as well. Uh, so uh, now, but, but, but still there's been the study of material, the material universe. And just now we're getting into a little bit of the study of the ethers. Now, by the ethers, you know what I'm talking about down here, the fourth, third, second, and first ether. And we have begun to penetrate scientifically into the lowest ether, into the lowest, uh, lowest one. And uh, yeah, uh, this one. And maybe there have been, I don't know, maybe some possible penetrations into the third ether. I wouldn't know how to identify that, but not into the second and the first ether. Not yet. Those are still occult. Now, just imagine, 
Just imagine what would happen uh, if that fifth ray of discovery, the way uh, led me to use it, the way Besant used it, uh, and other inner investigators began to use the fifth ray to investigate the astral plane. The fifth ray to investigate not just thinking, but the mental plane itself. The fifth ray, as France will do, we are told, uh, to investigate the nature of the soul the uh, higher three subplanes? And could we even take the fifth ray to investigate these higher levels? We could. And you, so you can see what a long path there is here, but what the potential of the fifth ray as it comes through Aquarius can be. There are all kinds of subtle energies, all kinds of subtle states, all kinds of what you might call action at a distance. You know, you don't have to necessarily touch something to make it move, a, a current of energy makes it move. I've seen that myself, you know, at least unless the videos are faked, you know, these days you, you can do that. But I have a feeling these were, you know, real things. This Russian woman, she had a glass bell, glass jar, and there was something in there and, and she never touched it. And basically she was manipulating the etheric currents so that the inner object was moving as her hands moved outside the glass uh, uh, jar. So that's the kind of thing that the fifth ray in Aquarius can examine. I, I remember a very uh, well-known scientist who was into all these new types of uh, processes. I think his name was Tiller or something of that nature. He came to our university and long time ago, and, uh, you know, the diet in the world teachers of physics were just about pulling their hair out, and they wanted to know all kinds of concrete things about what he was producing, but basically the evidence was right there in front of them, and, you know, they had such a wall of concretion in their uh, concrete mind that uh, they it was just a shock to their system to see these things happening, so they had to pretty much called it a hoax. How did you do that? How did you trick us? All that kind of thing. But in Aquarius, subtle energy is revealed. And also a lot of the, uh, we might call it the era of scientific brotherhood, you know, coming from Venus or from the Venus influence, basically a, a, a fifth ray soul, which is a ruler of the last decanate of Aquarius, or even the first decanate of Aquarius for, for some people, many people really, they'll go in via Venus and many more things will come to light which are presently hidden. And uh, we will find finally in the popular mind, the fifth ray turning to very subtle matters. Now already, if we're following particle physics, we see that happening. And, you know, we're going way out in space and we're doing amazing things with photography. And uh, we have probes going out beyond Pluto and, and so forth. That's all still on the physical plane, ingenious and amazing as it is. But just imagine when the inner worlds are going to be explored by the fifth ray, you know, through uh, uh, that, that fifth ray being basically the ray uh, of the hierarchy in this sense that Aquarius is the sign of the hierarchy. See, always the fifth ray comes through uh, Aquarius as a transmitted ray, and the hierarchy is known for all of these, uh, for all of its inner knowledge. And now some of that knowledge is going to, when I say knowledge, it's ray five, it's going to percolate down into the consciousness of humanity. So maybe no surprises there. Uh, it's going to be a scientific magical age. Why do I say it? Aquarius comes in, the, the triangle rotates, the fifth ray comes more through Aquarius than it's coming through Leo now, and the great seventh ray in another cycle, the ray of magic, accompanies all that. It's going to be a ray of, uh, uh, it's going to be a time of scientific magic. 
And uh, what we have to do is make sure the heart stays in it. And DK warm, warns us about the uh, purely mental magicians of the coming age who, you know, will either be working with materialism or uh, with strictly the material aspect and not with the altruistic love wisdom aspect. And that's where uh, white magic of the soul comes in and where people like ourselves uh, have to emphasize the white magic of the soul and the love energy particularly. Okay, so I think, um, I think then that we've got an idea now of how the, the fifth ray operates in terms of these three signs which form the triangle, uh, taking it from the constellations, three constellations, condensing into three signs and a ray, the fifth ray passing through all three of them. And the triangle is about to rotate, placing Aquarius at the apex. Uh, and, you know, that's, it's already happening maybe, and maybe only a century uh, away. Matter of fact, the whole, uh, the whole beginning of the Aquarian age, uh, free of the Piscean and sixth ray influence, is about 100 years ahead, a little bit less than that. Okay, so that's all I'm going to say because there is a time constraint uh, here today uh, because uh, one has to run over to the other computer and uh, talk about a little bit about what the Seven Ray Institute has tried to do in the field of esoteric psychology for the last uh, 35 years or so. So I want to make sure that, uh, you know, there's no sense of terrible rush and no mistakes uh, made. So now uh, let's say that it's your turn to ask uh, questions, make statements, anything that occurs to you regarding this particular uh, triangle or other triangles or, you know, other areas of occultism, uh, burning questions that you may have uh, I'm never closing the door on any types of questions because everything leads to everything else, you know, and everything is everything else, actually, but everything leads to everything else. So not that I can necessarily navigate it, but uh, someone can, and maybe we can um, uh, bring forward a little light on the subject. Okay. And this is not going to be, uh, this is going to be September, not August, right? Sorry for the next one. Okay. Nine and seven. Okay. So let's, um, your turn. Is there anybody? Looks like. Uh, okay. We have a. Uh, comment question from Vicky. Right. Could, could you please discuss Capricorn in relation to the fifth ray, as it rules the ten creative tenth creative hierarchy of Capricorn, page thirty five of Esoteric Astrology. Okay, Thank that, you. That's a good. That that is a good question. It's kind of interesting that even though through Capricorn the rays that are usually considered to be um, transmitted, the first ray, the third ray, and the seventh ray, with the seventh ray being dominant, there are some references which suggest that Capricorn, with all of its concretion uh, and with its connection with uh, initiation process, also has a, a close relation to the fifth ray, as if it almost transmits the the fifth ray. So, you know, we, we have a split there. And I said that the um, the fifth ray is the ray of cleavages. You know, it's the ray that divides. Now, when you when you look at uh, when you look at the map here, let's see if I can find it. Uh, yeah, well, I will find it the way I've got to find it, though, is a little bit uh, different. Uh, just give me a moment here. Uh, AAB diagrams and 
Okay, well, I'll just I'll just kind of start that and hope for the best. Um, yeah, here it is. This is the map, page 35, and also in Cosmic Fire. And basically, there is a split between the lower Agnishvatas and the higher Agnishvatas. The human personality or the crocodiles are involved with the lower aspects of personality. And those, of course, that's where the danger lies. If this if this um, split on the dotted line becomes too great, sectioning off the concrete mind, then we have the lower type of Capricorn who is, uh, well, he, he, he says, watch out, it's, it's hard, it's resistant, it's uh, cruel, it's oppressive, you know, all, it's all those things, it's evil. It's the lower part of the diamond which is embedded deeply in matter. But the mountain that goes upward, that part of the diamond that goes upward has to do with the higher mental plane. And these involve the higher Agnishvatas. You know, Agni is always there because it's part of the, Agni is in a way describing the personality of the solar logos. Agni Chaitans, Agni Suryans, Agni Agnishvatas. So the Agnishvatas here, there's a big battle here between the higher mind and the lower mind. And interestingly enough, the the symbol of the Sphinx is involved in this particular contest. Anyway, the higher mountain of the diamond uh, has to do with entering the fifth kingdom of nature. If we can meditate within the causal body within the egoic lotus, we really are <clears throat> members of the fifth kingdom of nature. And who is that provided by? This, this is all provided by the certain graduate human beings who are members of the fifth creative hierarchy of solar angels who have projected themselves as angels of the presence into this uh, egoic lotus so let's let's take a look once again at you know make sure that um okay you're you're i want to actually see your question uh bah, bah, bah. i've just got to find it again maybe maybe uh michael you can read the question again I, I should be able to find this, but I can't even. Oh, here it is. I got it. I got it. I'm sorry that. Um, so it's Vicky, and there's the question. Could you please discuss Capricorn? So low, you know, the best and the worst people found in Capricorn. The um, the the dangerous concrete mind, and the higher mind, both found in Capricorn. The possible possibility of negative initiations along the line of Mahat being found in Capricorn, but also the line to Sirius, which are is the line of initiation we are to take. Now, there's your number five again, because Sirius, like Venus, has a fifth ray soul. And many human beings have to go there because their manas is deficient, and they will be given additional manas in their training as solar angels on Sirius. Basically, uh, the solar angels are manasaputras, or they are uh, mind-born sons of, uh, mind-born sons of mind, learning more and more love. So theirs is a combination of the second ray, uh, which is found on the higher mental plane and the fifth ray, which is found on the plane of mind. Uh, the 10th creative hierarchy, uh, we have to consider them to be very sacrificial solar angels uh, who have descended twice. They have fallen twice. This is interesting. Uh, the fall of angels uh, is not just because of their moral iniquity. It's a sacrificial fall. 
uh, into from the cosmic astral plane back to the cosmic etheric levels of logoic, monadic, atmic, and buddhic. Okay, and then another fall through Sagittarian projection uh, into the dense physical body of the planetary logos and the dense physical body of the solar logos. That's the second fall of the fifth creative hierarchy, and it's a sacrificial fall. And so the number 10 is created. And it's kind of interesting, uh, these beings, let's take a look here. They will be connected with the fifth creative hierarchy. I wonder if I can, which is still, you know, which is just about to go onto the cosmic astral plane. And here it is. Uh, whoop, I, there it is. Huh? <laughs> here it is. And the fifth creative hierarchy, half of 10, in a way, um, is called Veiling the Christ. And Neptune will be the hierarchical ruler. So what's really interesting, you know, sometimes we hear that uh, Venus, the fifth ray soul there, is the lower octave of Neptune, and Neptune is the higher octave of Venus. Well, that's the relationship. This 10th or 5th creative hierarchy down on the, that has fallen onto the uh, cosmic physical plane uh, is uh, uh, Christ-related, but it's a lower octave of its higher, which is Neptune, which is related to the cosmic astral plane from which true love is coming. And basically, the solar angels are giving us the Christ impulse along with intelligence, because in a way, they are channeling this uh, Neptunian type of energy. Now, this fifth creative hierarchy, by the way, is destined to uh, enter the cosmic astral plane, but I think it has not yet completely done so and is still kind of hanging out on the first subplane of the cosmic physical plane. So it's destined to go here, but uh, it is still up here with the divine flames. Interestingly enough, this is a realm of Leo, and Leo is the number five again. So we have the old story of the lion and the unicorn. The unicorn is ruling down here, the 10th creative hierarchy and the lion up here, but it's a reversal in a way. In other words, our lion, when we consider this divine flames, is not a low lion. It's not the king of beasts. It's a great representation of our solar logos with the supreme energy of para shakti. I'm going to be getting into that in the treatise on cosmic fire uh, meeting because we're about to look at all of these different uh, uh, shaktis, I think, in our next, um, yeah, in our next presentation. So that will be, uh, hmm, that will be on Friday. That will be on Friday. Okay, well, I hope there are enough thoughts there to get us thinking about the number 10, the number five, Capricorn, uh, Leo, uh, the good, and the evil, the contrast of the Sphinx between the higher mind and the lower mind, the great battle that will take place at the Judgment Day between the higher mind and the lower mind, and the whole idea that um, there's a problem with Leo uh, when it's misused, and it creates this inflated egotism, which uh, is characteristic of the Lodge of Darkness. So. A lot of associated ideas here that uh, can be put together, and we understand that we have to live in the higher mind and not allow the lower concrete mind with its very, very strong lower fifth ray to become a separate sphere, the 13th sphere, and cut a human being off from all of the higher uh, uh, inspiration. Okay, I guess, you know enough said for the moment there are there are enough there are enough threads to follow there i think so okay
I'm continuing to look for hands raised, uh, and there are none at the moment, and there are no other questions or comments posted at the moment. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Anything about occultism in general? We have a little bit of time. Um, uh, we can spend it, um, you know, questions that you have on uh, general uh, occultism, and uh, you know we can we can do it that way, or maybe something will occur to you along the way that is on the subject that we have dealt with. Now, you know, I just got to say, let us all cultivate the fifth ray. Uh, it is necessary to do that in order to take the third initiation, and it certainly helps even. Uh, taking the second initiation because you've got to look at your astral body the way um, certain psychologists do in an analytical manner. And as Roberto Sagioli said, you know, stand back like a scientist from your personality. And most of us, you know, have the astral problems. Stand back and really analyze what is going on there and really see it as if you were looking at an object and not at your, you know, yourself. We sometimes say the self is so holy, you know, the lower lower self. But to be really objective about what's going on within my personality, that that is the fifth ray at work. And we all have to learn how to use it. Now, Alice Bailey did not have a fifth ray mind. She had a first ray mind. Nevertheless, um, she spoke uh, powerfully for the, having a clear, uh, well-stocked mind. And uh, so you can uh, take out clearly the items of knowledge which have to be explored on their own or which have to be explored in relation to other items of knowledge. And in the Aquarian age, uh, you know, uh, with the coming fifth ray, we're going to have to do more and more of that. It's not enough just to feel about things. Now, of course, feeling about them can lead to intuition, and that's very good. But the idea of throwing light on the subject, we can't get rid of our glamours unless we use the fifth ray coming out of the brow center, Venus, uh, to project that beam of light which helps to dissipate the glamours because we really see what they do. See, first of all, being, being the observer and not just the one who's involved, but using the fifth ray to be the observer, very, very important for all of us, whatever rays we do have. And eventually as we approach the uh, third initiation, maybe the fifth ray will be uh, made available in some uh, more intense manner for us. Maybe we'll be born with it or with a fifth ray personality, fifth ray mind, something, or at least have access to it indirectly through a sign. I mean, if you have a lot of Aquarius and uh, a lot of Leo together, let's say, you know, anything in this triangle, you do have indirect access to the fifth ray. In, 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 um, the letters on, uh, excuse me, the destiny of the nations. Uh, he gives analysis of uh, France, United States, United Kingdom, blah, blah, blah. He has something called indirect influences. And you take the ray influences from the planets that rule the signs. So there are many ways to access a ray that you do not have in your ray chart. Basically, we have them all. There's an emphasis, of course, but basically we have it all. And sometimes we just have to fill in more of something because the balance is not quite there. And Michael, yeah. Vicky has a whole series of questions Oh, my now. goodness. <laughs> okay. Yes. Oh, my goodness. Okay. How okay. much of what we study of the ancient wisdom will be preserved in our mental permanent atoms? That's the first. A lot. A lot. He says to RSU, he says, uh, um, there are so many 
books that you have read that are basically stored in your causal body, he wanted her to make better use of them. Uh, and if they're in the causal body, they're in the atomic triangle because the atomic triangle of mental unit, uh, astral permanent atom, physical permanent atom, are at the lower part of the egoic lotus. So what's in that atomic triangle is in the causal body and it is stored and it can be used. Uh, whether you'll have complete knowledge of where you got it, that's another matter. But it's there, and uh, it will at some point have to be used or dissipated or, you know, karmically uh, reconditioned. But it is, those are storage units, and there's a lot that remains of what you've done <clears throat> and what you've read and what you've read. Okay, go on. Are our study endeavors helping to build a thought form for humanity that can be used by students long after we leave this earth? Uh, it depends on how well we do. Now, it basically, we're supposed to think the plan into existence. And this means that if we have real clarity of thought, even if we don't contact a lot of people, that clarity of thought is is putting out there useful thought forms which others can pick up. And then there's the whole question of having clear thought along with the power to communicate it in a way that can be understood. And, and of course, there's the rub. Uh, we may think we're clear, but are we clear? And is it assimilated? And is it applied not only by ourselves, but by the people whom we are trying to educate. But most definitely, if we think clearly, we are improving the uh, mental atmosphere in general and making it easier for others to pick up the valuable thoughts. Go ahead. And I'd refer back to treatise, a treatise on cosmic fire where uh, the cosmic laws are all lumped under the laws of thought. Well, you know, basically, the uh, it's kind of interesting because even when we're studying will, we're studying love, uh, basically, we're still within the realm of Agni. And Agni is the lower 18 uh, subplanes of the cosmic subplanes uh, of the uh, super cosmic planes. So basically, we're in those 18 subplanes and they begin on the cosmic mental level. Now, as far as being able to penetrate into higher cosmic mind, uh, you know, like, uh, where can I go here? I'll show you what I mean. Um, see, here, here's our kind of cutoff point. Now, I've, I've never been able to quite decide for myself whether the Buddha succeeded with his cosmic touch of going anywhere outside the realm of Agni. The lower four planes that are not really drawn here, lower four cosmic planes are the highest planes of Agni, and they are cosmic mental. So all these laws that we're operating with uh, on these different levels, they may have origins that you know we cannot fathom, but basically uh, they all start with a, a kind of a mental basis. And in We've been studying that cosmic fire here, and he, he even calls will intelligent will and uh, intelligent love and all that. It has to do with remaining within the realm of Agni, which is the personality of the solar logos. So, um, and interestingly enough, the number 18 is a nine, and nine is the cyclic number of the ray of intelligence, the third ray. So there's a lot of, you know, reason why we're still within the realm of thought and we're not in the realm of, you know, uh, cosmic booty and cosmic atma and all that stuff. That, that is for beings far beyond our own uh, ability. Right. Okay. And the last of Vicky's question, 
What do you think our goals are as students beyond personal advancement in satisfying our thirst for understanding? Carry out the divine plan as much as may be possible. First of all, uh, uh, learn to be uh, a member of the ashram, which is that inner and higher group, which has its own uh, particular task and be a part of that according to one's abilities and uh, help to fulfill the will of the master at the center of the ashram to which you gravitate appropriately. You know, a lot of people try to force their way into ashrams for which uh, they are not suitable. It's like barking up the wrong tree. Basically, there's a job to do in each ashram and people who are members as souls of the ashram are going to carry that out. Master DK has uh, certain uh, things he's trying to do. He's trying to train uh, aspirants and disciples. He's uh, trying to bring forward healing. He's trying to bring right human uh, relations. That's one of the keynotes, major keynotes of his ashram, ashram. And in that respect, he's serving the head of the Ray Ashram, Master Kutumi, who is serving the Christ, who is serving Sanat Kumara, who is serving the planetary logos, who is serving the solar logos. And so there's a whole chain of command here. And if we play our part, um, well, the individual is uh, not counting so very much as long as the larger thing that we can help with is uh, somehow uh, manifesting, some, somehow. Uh, appearing. If you study meditation number four in Discipleship in the New Age, volume two, there are, it, it's, it's a good meditation for working individually, working with the plan and working in the light of Shambhala. It, it gives us a kind of a meditation, which he says will definitely uh, improve our ability to work with the divine plan. So first comes the plan. We serve the plan. Then we serve those the plan serves, and then we serve those who serve the plan. There's a threefold uh, section there, and the main thing is the divine plan. What is our place in it, and how do we serve it in a selfless manner? You know, what great theme are we trying to bring forward according to the ashram to which we really appropriately belong? We have to discover that, and we have to make approach oftentimes with a group, more and more with a group, make approach to the appropriate ashram. And now we're moving on to Jan's question. At this time, is there any astrological influence that's supporting this bloom of the Black Lodge coming out to be seen? It keeps gathering in expression, it seems, with each day. Is this some kind of showdown? Well, they know that the great um, conclave is coming, and they know that uh, their days are limited in effectiveness. I mean, they always find new ways of working in, but and maybe not until the judgment day are they completely banished, but uh, uh, they, they know they're in danger because now the reappearance process uh, really begins. Now, if you stop to think about it, uh, Pluto, the lord of the underworld, is in Capricorn, which can be used in an underworld sense. Saturn is in Capricorn as well. Pluto and Saturn have been conjunct in Capricorn, and it's a pretty good uh, line of attack. The lower Saturn and the lower Pluto and the lower Capricorn together is extremely destructive and materialistic. So those, those are some temporary uh, obstacles, but you know, um, we do have coming up uh, Neptune uh, before long uh, leaving Pisces. Well, Pisces is the general pralaya. Things are falling apart. Wherever there is a withering of the law and an uprising of lawlessness on all sides, then I manifest my, myself from age to age for the uh, destruction of, how does it go, for the uh, upliftment or the, uh, I forget what the word is, but the the idea of the, uh, up, yeah, I'll just use the word, upliftment of those who good, do good and the destruction of such as do evil. 
and it's uh, from the Bhagavad Gita. So that is kind of a showdown in a way. And DK said there would be a fight to the last ditch by the forces of materialism. Uh, have, is the last ditch coming before 2025, or are we going to have a number of this, uh, quite a bit of this last ditch resistance during uh, the age uh, that leads up to the beginning of the Aquarian age? Don't forget, as he said, you can have universal death in Aquarius. Not such a pleasant thing, but Aquarius does rule epidemics, interestingly. You know, it rules the spread of whatever. It rules circulation. Is it good? Is it bad? What's circulating? So, you know, we cannot romanticize Aquarius. Uh, it, it, it can lead to the destruction of uh, atomic energy, though Foster Bailey assures us that DK said there would be no atomic war. And this was by 1952, but the, the whole idea of there possibly being a great uh, epidemic, that 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 remained a possibility, and it seems like we're in the process, that humanity is being forced closer together under uh, corrected circumstances because everybody's in danger and there is a common uh, enemy. So, uh, yes, there is, uh, there are some astrological influences and, and and also just the ray cycles. You know, we have the, the, the end of the age of Pisces, and that is really the withering of the law. And we see it all around us. People don't care what the law is, and they uh, do what they please uh, according to their egotism. And that has to be banished by seeing... Uh, how terrible a thing it is when you do not obey the correct laws that have been uh, set up by more intelligent founders of nations and more soul-connected founders of nations. So it is a kind of a showdown. The only thing I don't know is that once the appearance of the uh, hierarchy is beginning in earnest, how much of a continuing fight there will be beyond 2025, and I suspect uh, it. I suspect that there will be. Uh, so I think that until we really reach the clearing, when uh, Pisces and the sixth ray are pretty well evaporated, or at least returning to their places of origin, uh, there's going to be a, a, a battle as the uh, forces of darkness attempt to do everything they can to uh, thwart the proper entry into the age of Aquarius. Yep. Not, not pleasant, but okay, but uh, we, uh, we have the means to help. And uh, well, you know, the uh, John the Baptist got his head cut off. Uh, well, what will happen to the group John the Baptist? We don't know. That's the new group of world servers, but we imagine that we can be somewhat effective. Uh, John the Baptist, uh, singly, he drew attention uh, to the coming of uh, the Christ in a single manner, and the group, uh, John the Baptist, the new group of world servers, is drawing attention to the coming of the hierarchy and the new uh, method of approach of the Christ. Okay. Yeah, as students of the ageless wisdom, th this is my my yeah. question. As students of the ageless wisdom, you know we've got uh, what we'll call laws, which have been uh, put out by uh, human minds, and then we have a hierarchy of uh, call them spiritual or or universal laws. Uh, and at times, the, the, what is put out by human minds may be in conflict with that put out by divinity. And perhaps it's uh, something that we uh, perhaps need to uh, look at more deeply as far as, you know, which which laws do we hold on to foremost? 
Well, I think a, a good example of that is the Atlantic Charter and the Four Freedoms. These were uh, sort of proclamations on the high seas uh, by Churchill and uh, FDR, which uh, basically were as much of the statement uh, regarding the principles of Shambhala as could be given to humanity uh, at the time. So, you know, um, it all depends on who is the lawmaker. Uh, we have, uh, you know, something like the Emancipation Proclamation, uh, basically um, put forward by Lincoln. And obviously, this has to do with the great law of freedom on Sirius. So there's a, there's a real alignment there. And uh, lesser uh, minds and lesser hearts uh, may put forward laws, but if, if there is a, um, a noticeable incongruence between the uh, inner laws, uh, spiritual laws of which we are aware, and the outer fabrications of man, then we know that by the power of friction, those outer laws will wear away and will not abide because what will abide is these higher laws. But we have to notice who are the lawmakers, what are their motives, who are the highest lawmakers, and uh, who are those who are simply operating to create laws which further their own uh, personal egotistical uh, objectives. Uh, in the last analysis, um, a high group of laws man-made will align with the inner group of laws. What did he say? By the year uh, 2035, Russia will sponsor legislation for the welfare of children, and it will be backed up by the United States, both of them Aquarian soul countries. Well, you know, some of these uh, predictions uh, do not work out in time the way the Tibetan said they would, but he was quite specific about 2035, and that's 15 years from now. So think of the kind of development that has to be. The basic thing is to be sensitive enough to what are the laws of the soul, the laws of the system, the laws of Sirius. You know, there, there are certain laws that really apply to us more than others, and to be able to measure properly uh, and, and with clarity, the congruence or the incongruence of man-made laws with the higher laws that we know will abide. And then uh, when we recognize incongruence, we have to act either esoterically or through our lawmakers or through the vote or, you know, we have to act in some way to make congruence out of incongruence. At least, you know, that's what occurs to me at, at this point. Some things last. Man-made laws do not last unless they are really in alignment. I mean, here's a law. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. It's a commandment in a way. It has lasted in 16 different major religions in the world. They all say the same thing. And, of course, you know, that has to do with the great uh, law of cohesion, the law of love, the law of attraction, it is backed by uh, systemic and cosmic laws. And, and the Tibetan gives a good description of the distinctions between laws, and, commands or orders, yeah. and rules. Right, exactly. Yeah, exactly. The laws, they don't vary. Uh, the rules are based on experience. Uh, commands are sometimes uh, forced and overpowering, but uh, it depends on who's commanding. Uh, we have commandments, you know. And one of them, the 11th commandment, is uh, based on the universal law of attraction, uh, which has kind of a corollary, the law of brotherhood, which has to do with monadic relations. Well, look, you know more about it. You're doing the research on this, and it's, it is extensive. But at least those are the things that, uh, you know, that I think are going on. And we, have, we need the discrimination 
to see when man-made laws are corrupt and simply serve uh, egotistical purpose. And then we have to have the courage uh, to find ways to weaken such laws and or be rid of them. I think, you know, when it comes to Neptune and Pisces, it may be a general prolia for the sixth ray and the age of Pisces, but it also will get rid of a lot of the uh, baggage of the Piscean age. So uh, it will help dissolve a lot of that. So it's not all a bad thing by any means. Yeah, it becomes a distinction between what is moral and uh, what is legal. Okay, that's, I think that's a good way of putting it. And, you know, there's always these legal loopholes, but uh, when it comes to moral loopholes, I don't think uh, they are in abundance, you know, basically. It has to do with right human relations. And there's no way to get around, uh, you know, there's no way to have bad human relations and pretend they're right human relations. It, it is a pretense that won't last. And uh, we, we see it being acted out right now. Well, thank you very much. And uh, there are no other comments or questions in the chat box. And I'm seeing no hands raised. So perhaps being 26 minutes after the hour, yeah. Um, good. We, we can bring up the great invocation and then you have lots of time to prepare for the next event. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the next hour. event will, will be a short meditation based on uh, esoteric uh, psychology. Um, and, you know, sort of the, maybe a little bit of background about the Seven Ray Institute. Uh, I, the The... I, I I made a mistake. I should have had it as a Zoom meeting, but uh, I was uh, I just made a mistake. That's all. And uh, instead, it is a broadcast, and so I don't yet know the method whereby people can speak. But there is a method whereby people can write, can make statements, can ask questions, whatever, and that's uh, in the chat box on the side. And so there can be some uh, uh, communication. And uh, I just wanted to celebrate it a little bit. 35 years is a long time, you know. Uh, interestingly enough, it's a number that is associated with the fifth ray. At least the ray theorist, Stephen Pugh, uh, he believes that uh, three, five is connected with the fifth ray, two, five with the fourth ray. And the Tibetan pretty well gives it one, five with the sixth ray. So interesting that we would have a lot of discussion here on the uh, fifth ray. And uh, we've used in the uh, Seven Ray Institute uh, a fair number of fifth ray methods, which uh, I'll, I'll be at liberty to speak a little about. It's just our normal YouTube um, link, you know, that you've been coming to for all these broadcasts, if you've been coming to the broadcast. so. Um, We'll see you there in about a half hour, and hopefully, uh, you know, it won't last long, and uh, I'll be able to fill you in on a few things, and we'll have a little meditation on this these matters. Okay, friends, so lots of love from all of us on the communications group, uh, and we'll, um, we'll go over to the next uh, broadcast now, but, uh, and this will be converting, and uh, Please feel free to advise your friends or those who may be interested that they can find these things on Makara. And uh, if they're interested in the subject, then uh, they'll maybe learn learn something from it. So uh, we'll we'll be seeing you shortly. In some cases, bye bye.